Tonight, Microsoft calls it the tablet that will replace your laptop. Photoshop is coming to touch screens, and a New York taxi insider joins Uber. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 91 for Tuesday, May 20th, 2014. I'm Sarah Lane, and our top story tonight, Microsoft is unveiling the Surface Pro 3. There was a conference. It was well attended, and there are a lot of questions now of, is it going to live up to all of the hype? Joining me now is Brad Charkis, senior writer over at PC World. Hey, Brad. Hey, how's it going, Tara? Very well, thanks. Okay, so you've had quite a long day. You've been covering the Surface Pro 3. The, the news started coming in. It was kind of right when I woke up. So... It's a tablet, but Microsoft is really pushing this as a laptop replacement. What do you think? Um, I think a laptop replacement is uh, more accurate to what it really is. Um, it's actually what it is is a very unique beast. Um, it's kind of what the Surface has wanted to be all along. It's a tablet, technically. It's just barely thicker than the iPad. It's obviously a little bit bigger at 12 inches, uh, but it has full... Windows 8 capabilities. It has, uh, you know, a full Core i7 processor in some configurations. It's a full laptop, but in finally for the first time in the Surface history, uh, you know, true tablet portability form factor. Yeah, on stage, uh, Microsoft definitely was kind of hammering that home that a lot of people are uh, love their tablets, but are used to having a laptop and a tablet at the same time with all of the touch functionality. But the fact that the Surface Pro 3 is is really touted as uh, the, 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 the single workstation that you really need, is that enough for people who still think of tablets as uh, consumption devices? Well, I don't think that the Surface Pro 3, for as impressive as it is, and I do think it's a very impressive device, I don't believe that it's truly going to be a hit with everyday consumers for, you know, a few different reasons. Um, one, being its sheer size. Uh, two, plenty of people already have laptops and tablets. Uh, three, it's it's actually still, as impressive as it, is, as it is, a very niche device. I mean, how many people want to spend premium dollars for... Uh, what's essentially a very, very thin Ultrabook. Right. Uh, especially when laptops, have, lap, uh, Windows laptops these days, you know, the average selling price is like 500 bucks. So these are way more expensive than your average tablet, than your average laptop. I don't think it's going to be a hit with consumers. I do think it has chances to break into the enterprise and business markets. Um, but I don't think this is going to be, you know, an iPad ask sell a gajillion devices kind of a deal. Then again, there were a lot of comparisons made on stage to both the Apple iPad and the MacBook Air, which of course is the thinnest Apple laptop that are available and, and neither are the cheapest option. They've got competitors, but that's sort of that top end of the pricing range. Do you think that that was intentional on Microsoft's part so that the public could get used to the fact that yeah, $750 doesn't sound like that much? Um, yes, that could definitely be part of it. I think uh, definitely they're establishing this as a premium device, which it very, very clearly is. Um, I also believe that, you know, Apple is really their competitor as far as integrated hardware software solutions like this go. And uh, if you compare this against those two things, it actually stacks up pretty favorably. I mean, it is, you know, just barely thicker than an iPad, yet much thinner than a MacBook Air, and, you know, offers full laptop support. It's, uh, you know, a very intriguing device. Uh, ooh, what do you think? <laughs> you, you mentioned in your really? article that the screen stole the show. Uh, yeah. what, is such, what is such a show stealer about the screen? And, you know, we, we had all these rumors about a smaller Surface Mini tablet. That obviously didn't pan out. I mean, is, is the screen really uh, uh, amazing enough to justify the largeness of it? Well, at PC World, we focus on productivity. And mm -hmm. the screen of this iPad, of not this iPad, this uh, <laughs> Surface Pro 3, when you look at it, I know, I know. <laughs> when you look at the Surface uh, Pro 3, you look at it and you just go, wow, that's much more of a laptop. 
-hmm. It has the three two aspect ratio. So it looks like a notebook, not like this weird little short rectangle that the other Surface Pros are. Um, it's gorgeous. I mean, it's pixel packed. It's, you know, huge, very, very high resolution. It uh, has a high contrast ratio. He was, uh, Panos Panay was touting that all day today. Um, you just look at it and you think it's a laptop. And that's what this device is supposed to be. As they say, it's the tablet that replaces your laptop. And you look at that and you get it just looking at this. Um, as far as Surface Mini goes, I was actually really surprised not to see it there today, as I think a lot of people were as well, especially after Microsoft was teasing this event as a small gathering, you know. Right. Everyone thought they were slyly saying, hey, we're releasing the Surface Mini. Um, I was shocked it wasn't there. Um, I think I'm much more impressed with the Surface Pro 3 than I probably would have been with the Surface Mini, though, so I'm not disappointed. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, they're, they're definitely pushing towards productivity, enterprise, and as you say, if it's actually more of a laptop competitor... That is almost, although it's considered a tablet as well, it's almost puts it in its own category because I really don't think, save for a few folks, I, I do a show about iPads and I don't think an iPad is a laptop replacement, at least at this point. But maybe that Surface Pro 3's hinge is uh, is, is the secret sauce. Yes, definitely. I agree. Um, laptops, uh, iPads can be amazing productivity devices. I don't think they're laptop replacements either, much like you and much like Panos Panay, the servant said, was driving home at the event today. Um, like you say, I think this is Microsoft playing to its strengths. Microsoft is, you know, firmly established in business and enterprise. And this is clearly a device targeting business and enterprise. It's, you know, very sexy, although I hate that word. It's <laughs> very niche. Nothing says sexy it like enterprise. But yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> Brad Charkis is a senior writer over at PC World. Brad, thanks so much for talking with us and let folks know where they can find more of your work. Um, you can check me out daily on PCWorld.com. Um, I'm also in the PC World Tablet Edition, which you can pick up on Android, iPad, and the Kindle Fire. Excellent. We will do that and come back soon. Thanks, Sarah. Hope to be back again. All right. Let's move on to the rest of tonight's top news in the tech feed. All right, so it's not just about hardware when it comes to the Surface Pro 3. Adobe's newest version of Photoshop CC also got some stage time this morning. It's designed specifically for use with a touchscreen and a stylus. Icons are twice as big to make them easier to tap. You've got gestures like pinch and zoom. They're all built in now. And the software will be ready to support those high-density displays, not just for the Surface, but for other PCs, too. China's central government procurement center has banned government use of Windows 8 as part of a notice on the use of energy-saving products, which was posted on its website last week. However, the official Xinhua news agency says this is to ensure computer security after Microsoft ended support for Windows XP, which was and is still widely used in China. Data firm Canalyst says of the ban, quote, China's decision to ban Windows 8 from public procurement hampers Microsoft's push of the OS to replace XP, which makes up 50% of China's desktop market. A top official at the Taxi and Limousine Commission, Ashwani Chabar... Chabra, I tried that earlier, in the, anyway, is joining Uber as the company's first head of policy development and community engagement, which is just days after the commission approved an extension of a pilot program for street hailing smartphone apps like Uber and Halo and Taxi Magic. This is after a report from the taxi commission last week said that the apps had been a success. In response to black car and taxi industries that are already established that complained the apps would undercut their business, the commission's review found that e-hails, I love that term, accounted for less than one in every 200 yellow cab pickups and aren't significantly undercutting anyone's business. All right, in a time where net neutrality and peering and interconnect relationships are all very hot topics, Dan Rayburn of Streaming Media Blog reports that Apple has been pretty mum on the whole subject, and that's at least in part because the company has been building out their own CDN, Content Delivery Network, to deliver its own software updates and apps and other Apple-related content that's been going on over the past year, and that the company is currently negotiating paid interconnection deals with large, major ISPs in the U.S. 
So why Apple's silence then? According to Sandvine data, Apple takes up only 2% of total internet traffic at peak. Compare that to Netflix, which takes up to 34% at peak times. However, when Apple released iOS 7 last year, installs and app downloads accounted for nearly 40% of all the traffic inside ISP's networks almost instantly. So having a smooth flow of traffic obviously matters to Apple, as do performance issues with iCloud, and of course, Apple wanting to have more control over the end user experience. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office granted Apple a modified version of a property covering solar panel integration and portable devices today. Apple's U.S. patent number, 8,730,179, covers an, quote, integrated touch sensor and solar assembly. It's essentially an invention for integrating solar panels into touch sensing components in a portable device. Apple will almost definitely use this technology in a production model of an iPhone or an iPad at some point as consumer demand obviously ramps up for high resolution screens, but also thinner designs. The tech would help boost power reserves and support that main battery cell to extend usage time. That rumor from yesterday that Twitter was considering buying music streaming service SoundCloud, well, the Wall Street Journal says the deal is off because, quote, the numbers didn't add up. That's according to an anonymous source. German publication Dear Spiegel is also reporting that the talks have ended. SoundCloud is a free site that lets people upload and share audio files and would have been Twitter's biggest purchase to date at its current valuation of $700 million. Might have had something to do with it. Finally, the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, regularly hires hackers to help build out its cybercrime division. But it also has a rule where it will not hire anyone who has smoked marijuana in the past three years. As you might imagine, this is making the hiring process rather difficult. Yesterday, FBI Director James Comey told an audience at the White Collar Crime Institute that, quote, I have to hire a great workforce to compete with those cyber criminals. And some of those kids want to smoke weed on the way to the interview. He also says the agency is grappling with that question right now. I can't wait to find out how this all plays out. And that's for the, uh, it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TN2 and write us at TN2 at twit.tv. Don't miss Tech News Today. That's tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.